Okay, so Michael is going to uh, talk about uh, matrix element sums evaluated by a differential equations and calculations of atomic molecular properties. And of course, as I pointed out earlier, this is all reminiscent of the O'Donnell Lewis method of 56. Michael. So I'm delighted to, to have the opportunity to, to give a talk at this symposium. Uh, let me give a little bit of background first. Uh, I was very fortunate in uh, 42 years ago in what Avine would call AD 38 to embark on a PhD with, with Alex at the Queen's University of Belfast. Not only was I getting the opportunity uh, to, be some, uh, to be exposed to the best of scientific method, but it was also the beginning of a long friendship with, with Alex over 42 years. Uh, it's said that the mark of a gentleman is somebody who always has time and interest in other people. And I can certainly say that Alex is one of the uh, scientific gentlemen of the world in that sense. Uh, in 1967, uh, Alex uh, moved here, as you know, and he invited me to come and work with him and to finish my PhD here. Uh, that, in a sense, was a life-changing experience because for those of us who lived in Northern Ireland in those days, to go across the water, as they say there, to England was a big deal. So to come transatlantic was uh, really quite something. The, <coughs> uh, Gordon uh, was uh, reminiscing about the poker club. When I first joined uh, Alexander's Ragtime Band, as it were, in, uh, and we had the, uh, the poker club, I probably had the distinction of being the worst ever of uh, the poker group. Uh, Alex may remember that uh, around 1962, which I think would be AD 34, he appeared on Ulster Television giving a talk about computers and applied mathematics. And I remember uh, in my last year in school seeing that, and I was very, very interested in it. Uh, it struck me that the name Dalgarna was exotic, and at the time I didn't know it was Scottish. So as I live in Scotland now, I thought I would uh, do a little bit of brief investigation before coming. I discovered two things. There's a small group of Dalgarno in uh, the southwest of Scotland, the outlying states, they could be the Rydberg states of the Dalgarnos, but the main ones are in Aberdeen, and that uh, Alex uh, is, of course, from Aberdeen. Further investigation, uh, just using the internet, I discovered that a literary club called the Maitland Club was formed in Glasgow in 1828, AD minus 100, and one of their interests was in the works of a previous Dalgarno from uh, Aberdeen, who was also a scientist, and uh, he, he was also concerned with very much with other people, and he invented uh, the sign language for the hard of hearing. So it may be that Alex is uh, related in some way to George Dalgarno, who lived in uh, 1650 or thereabouts. Uh, George Dalgarno had some correspondence with uh, people like Leibniz, as it happened. But to get back to, uh, to cut to the chase and get back to the main thrust of the talk. Uh, hmm. uh, as we know from this meeting, the contributions that Alex has made in science in general is just staggering by anybody's appearance. Yeah. Uh, the uh, areas that we, that we've seen that he has covered is uh, atomic and molecular physics, which is uh, what I was studying. Uh, the Earth's atmosphere, planetary atmospheres, uh, he just made an enormous contribution in that. And then chemistry of the interstellar medium, a subject which he more or less invented, and uh, as we've seen over the last two days, has had a, an enormous uh, uh, influence and contribution. When I was preparing this talk, I referred to about 55 of Alex's papers, and that is something uh, approximately 5% of his uh, total output. Well, to move uh, to what I'm going to talk about, uh, this is just one aspect of what uh, Alex has done over the years. Uh, and for any, any other person, just to have done this on their own would be uh, a lifetime of uh, scientific achievement. But uh, this is just one small part of uh, what Alex has done altogether. Uh, perturbation theory uh, very often leads to, as we saw from Gordon's talk, two expressions of uh, infinite summations of matrix elements. They can be recast, as Alex uh, realized, in uh, terms of uh, 
a few terms that depend on uh, the solution of uh, differential equations. Uh, in the early days, of course, those differential equations were difficult to solve, and only in a few cases are analytic solutions available, uh, hydrogen and hydrogen-like ions being uh, typical examples. So the way to do it, really, was to uh, get either a numerical variational method, which is the kind of things that Gordon was talking about, or some kind of uh, finite step method. And Alex was one of the first people to use a computer to solve these problems. He had solved, used this uh, computer with the great name of Whirlwind uh, in, at MIT in the 50s. Uh, those were the days when computers were given really good names and not silly names like Apple. So he used the Whirlwind computer and realized that computers were going to become available much more widely. And once, uh, once computers became available, uh, then the numerical solutions of these equations would become commonplace fairly easy to do. Well, easy is probably not the right, the right word. The challenge in the early days of computers, of course, was to get it to run long enough before it developed a hardware fault. Nowadays, it's to uh, write a program that doesn't have a fault built into the middle of it somewhere. Where were we there? Oh, so they were it's 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 sorry, it's the mistress. <laughs> the whirlwind <laughs> computer. So let's see what this is about. Uh, so I'm going to just take a, a completely trivial example just to show, show you how the method works. Uh, suppose we want to calculate, just say, the static dipole polarizability. And uh, Gordon was talking, you've seen that equation uh, three quarters of an hour ago or so. Uh, that would be the expression for the dipole polarizability. And uh, in that, we have an infinite sum uh, over matrix elements over the complete set, set of states that we're looking at. Uh, this is with the polarizability of something in the ground state, which I've designated zero, and the S are just the excited states. And these are the energies. Uh, the S prime indicates that we've got an integration over all the states except the ground state, and including the continuum. This is rather awkward to calculate, of course. Uh, that expression tells us what the polarizability is going to look like. And just before continuing, uh, Gordon me mentioned the model potential methods, where you try and get a model spectrum of some kind. And that is where you uh, effectively you have a structure that looks like that one, uh, except if you put a finite number of states in, and you have to get some kind of uh, way of calculating what the effective dipole uh, matrix element would be and what the effective energy is. And we've seen that that is uh, uh, a very powerful method. Uh, but if you were to if you're trying to do this uh, numerically, it's inconvenient. Uh, uh, there's an infinite number of sum of terms, so you, you have to uh, satisfy yourself with a finite number of them. And each of those terms, of course, is very awkward to calculate. Each of those terms has got a big calculation in itself, because you've got to know what the excited state is, and you've got to know what its energy is, and then you've got to do that integral. And of course, what you do about the continuum is not at all obvious. Uh, the model spectrum methods of uh, Gordon deal with it, have got methods of dealing with the uh, continuum. So really, you end up just truncating the sum and doing an inconvenient calculation, and you don't know how accurate it's going to be. The method advocated by Alex, of course, was to say that if we took this differential equation at the bottom, uh, that, and we solved that differential equation, and uh, put, calculate this uh, quadrature here, then we've got back the same as we had here. I'm just going to concentrate on the simple early cases of uh, spherical atoms uh, so that we can uh, take out these terms which uh, deal with uh, orthogonality. So we've got that uh, simple differential equation, and we can solve that on a computer. So that looks great. So uh, have we got something for nothing out of this practical way of calculating it? Well, not quite. Uh, Gordon showed that slide in his talk. That's the uh, dynamic uh, dipole polarizability for a uh, frequency nu. And this uh, then is, uh, uh, th that is the uh, infinite sum way of doing it. And uh, when we uh, use the method of, uh, of Alex, we get it reduced just down to this quadrature and uh, where these functions chi plus or minus nu satisfy these differential equations. So we solve the equations, put it into there, and there it is. 
So what's the catch? It looks just too easy. Well, there are some catches when you do this, because let's suppose that the uh, excitation frequency was, uh, uh, that the applied frequency was close to exciting the atom into one of the, ex into one of the excited states. If we do that, then let's, we'll not have it exactly that, because that's another problem. But if it's close to it, we're going to find that this state uh, is actually very important in the sum. And if that's a, a high up state, as it were, say a Rydberg state in, in, a, in an atom, it's going, to, it's going to occupy a lot of space. Uh, usually we're uh, reducing these equations into uh, equations where we're just dealing with the, art, with the radial coordinate. So we have a lot of space uh, to encompass. And if that, that situation was satisfied, and we integrated our differential equation out, say, typically for an atom, to five or six atomic units. But this state was actually occupying space, say, out, out say, 20 atomic units. Then the method, of course, will not give an accurate answer. So you don't totally get something for nothing. Uh, if this is going to excite one of these states, you've got to make sure that the range of integration that you use is enough to hold that state, because you are representing it in, with this sum. Uh, also, the finite step solutions become slightly difficult uh, if you're close to one of these resonances. And for an atom, the situation is slightly worse, because if you're high up in the Rydberg states, if it's close to, to that one, it's going to be close to a lot of the other ones as well, because all the states are close together at that stage. So you don't get something for nothing. Uh, but it's uh, just a superbly good method of calculating something like this, as long as you're careful. Uh, Alex then, uh, with Lewis, uh, formulated some sum rules which became famous, uh, which uh, are famous, uh, just to see how they work. If we take the second order energy for some perturbation V, uh, we get that expression there. And uh, what I've done there is simply to move the summation over the things that depend on S into the middle. And when you look at that, you can see that this middle bit then is just the projector of that uh, resolvent. Uh, or 1 over h minus e0 onto, these, onto this set of states. And because we've uh, taken out the ground state, it's the ones that are uh, orthogonal to that. So when you do that, when you take this out, uh, you can see that that expression there is the same as this one, where it is satisfying a differential equation. Uh, we've just really done that for the polarizability, where the perturbation was the uh, dipole moment. Of course, one might argue it's a, a bit of a tautology, because possibly the way you got this in the first place was to see this differential equation. But to evaluate this, the best thing to do is to go to the differential equation. Uh, Dalgano and Lewis paper, which is famous, was concerned with calculating long-range uh, interactions. Uh, and one of the things that they found useful to, to do was to express this fir first order perturbed function as a product of the ground state and something else. And it's the something else that you have to know. So if you, if you know that chi is the product of the ground state and something else, then uh, you can go back and put it into that uh, quadrature. You've got to be a little bit careful, of course, because the something else part uh, will, uh, has a risk of having poles at the point where the ground state is 0, so that the product uh, is 0. So when you put that into this uh, expression, you end up with this more general rule. And there is a typo in that, uh, which I'll come to in a minute. Uh, you take some arbitrary function g, and you're trying to calculate uh, that infinite summation. And you find that it can be written just as these quadratures on the right-hand side, uh, where the function f satisfies a differential equation. And the, the typo is that that, should, that g there should be an f. So that is uh, the famous sum rule of Dalgarno and Lewis which has got numerous applications, which I may or may not have time to uh, just mention briefly. Two more sum rules which were useful, and also done uh, by Dalgarno and Lewis, and then by Dalgarno and Stewart, were this one. Uh, uh, they just turn out to be useful in uh, evaluating things like long-range forces. Uh, and uh, Dalgarno and Stewart paper, where they had uh, uh, written down the expression for the first order correction to a, a diagonal matrix element. Uh, L will be uh, some operator, very often a one electron operator. And you want to find out 
that if a perturbation is added to the system, uh, how does that L change? And they showed that it changes to this expression, where once again you need to solve a differential equation. Otherwise, that thing is going to be an infinite sum. So we come to a couple of applications following. Uh, I'll just uh, qu quickly uh, list them rather than describe them, because I don't think it's enough time to describe them. Uh, early papers, and a lot of these were actually done in, uh, in Belfast, uh, on long-range forces by Dalgarno, Lewis, and Lin. And uh, we'll see at the end that these long-range force calculations still, uh, are still being done now. These were all being done in the 50s. Uh, polarizabilities were done by Dalgarno, Chan, Parkinson, etc. cetera, uh, George Victor. The Thomas Kuhn sum rule, which Alex was able to prove, uh, almost falls automatically out of the differential equation formalism. Uh, properties of uh, uh, something like HE, H2+, plus, right, with Dalgarno and Stewart, they were calculating things like uh, magnetic sus susceptibilities, uh, diagnetic sus susceptibilities. All one electron operators go going back to just uh, using that equation there. So this is just uh, a list, and, uh, and that's a short list of the uh, things that uh, have, uh, where the applications have been made. We'll come on to the next place where this kind of formalism was used, and that is uh, hartree fock theory. There are basically, as I see it, three problems which uh, Alex addressed. Uh, the first problem is where you're trying to solve the hartree fock equations themselves, uh, and you know that there's a closely related problem that you do know the answer to. That's to say, you have a Hamiltonian which you can solve, but uh, it's not the hartree fock Hamiltonian. So what you're actually doing then is to treat the perturbation as a difference between the Hartree-Fock approximation and some solvable problem. And then you come back to calculating, say, something like the uh, dipole polarizability, which, uh, <clears throat> or, or com coming back to calculating some uh, diagonal property. And then you just need to go back and use uh, that equation there. The second kind of Hartree-Fock problem is where you're actually trying to solve the uh, uh, you solve the hartree fock problems themselves, and you ask, uh, how can I actually get a better answer than that? Uh, how can I deal with correlation, which is essentially the difference between the hartree fock answer and the real answer? And in that case, the, uh, you try to solve the hartree fock equations, and that, of course, has become more and more possible with more and more powerful computers, uh, even in the 60s when this was being started. And uh, in that case, the perturbation that you're dealing with is the difference between the real problem and the Hartree-Fock problem. And once again, you just go back to the uh, uh, correct the diagonal matrix elements in this way. Uh, Alex with Morris Cohen, who is here, uh, <coughs> also proved that uh, if you have the exact Hartree-Fock problem, that the diagonal corrections are actually zero. And that was a very important result. Uh, the third Hartree-Fock problem is where you turn on an external perturbation which could be time varying or fixed, an electric field, and then you go ahead and calculate the polarizabilities. Uh, the problem that I looked at for my PhD, that Alex had suggested to me, was to look at the time-dependent Hartree-Fock equations. Uh, these have a kind of magic property, because when you solve them, you discover that what you've solved, say the dipole polarizability, has automatically got the, uh, it automatically got the correlation built in to first order. Uh, it's equivalent to the random phase approximation, something which had been shown in some cases, and uh, something which I uh, also proved in my thesis. Uh, so I'd done some work. Uh, George Victor had done a lot of work on this. Uh, and then uh, these people, Alex, and then this group, Hurst, Kavish, and Kavishwar, had done a lot of work on shielding factors. Uh, shielding factors is where you're allowing for the change in, in an external electric field uh, due to the polarizability of the atom that is being applied to. These were then extended by uh, uh, Devi Watson, who I think is here, to uh, look at a molecular version. Uh, what I was looking at was uh, very simple, just uh, helium uh, and uh, Devi Watson. And uh, I think that this is a different Stuart. I think it's Ron Stewart. Uh, they extended that to a molecular version and then uh, Walter Johnson and others uh, extended it to a uh, relativistic version. 
The Hartree-Fock equations look like this, so the, the time-dependent ones. So they're like the ones that uh, were shown earlier for the polarizability, except that they've got this extra coupling term in. Uh, but uh, they're a set of solvable problems. Uh, a couple of things that I've been involved in, in visiting Alex over the years was uh, pre-dissociation calculation, where we had uh, shown that the Dalgarno and Lewis method can be used to uh, simplify the expression for the shift. Uh, the pre-dissociation is, uh, is effectively the uh, interaction between a continuum state with, which is degenerate with uh, a bound state uh, of a molecule. Uh, it turns out that the schumann runge band, bands of O2 had been looked at very extensively at, at the CFA by an experimental group, uh, which was uh, uh, basically uh, Bill Parkinson and Yoshino and uh, Alan Chung visiting and others. And they had a, a great deal of data on the schumann runge bands. We were able to use this uh, theory to uh, uh, analyze that data and explain it, basically to try and find uh, interaction potentials. Uh, the other problem that I had looked at recently uh, was uh, uh, with uh, these uh, uh, other authors, and this was really developed by uh, Marinesco and Alex and Hussain, uh, was to uh, look at Raman and uh, Rayleigh scattering. In, that, uh, in these cases, uh, you get uh, something called the, the goffert mayer expression uh, for uh, uh, that describes, for example, the, the Raman scattering. And that is an infinite, or one, again, one of these infinite sums, which can be uh, reduced to something manageable by solving uh, perturbed differential equations. And we looked at different differential equations like this. Uh, one of the twists there is that when you come close to one of the uh, uh, schumann run resonances, that uh, these things become uh, uh, difficult to solve. And we put in a, a width into the, uh, into the negative frequency version of it so when h nu coincided with one of the excitation uh, schumann runge frequencies, uh, uh, then this thing wouldn't explode. And we were able to use for these widths the, the data which we'd come, uh, had originally come from this experimental work at the CFA. Uh, at the moment, of course, you, you know that there's just uh, an explosion of interest in uh, low temperature physics. And, uh, uh, low temperature physics, the low, low temperature collisions is uh, extremely sensitive to uh, knowledge of, for example, what the, the long range interaction between uh, atoms and molecules would be. And uh, uh, this theory is being, uh, uh, as we speak, more or less being, being developed uh, by Alex and collaborators. Uh, and uh, what they're doing is to calculate things like the, uh, the leading order van der Waals term and, and the others, say uh, C6, uh, with relativistic effects. And essentially, it comes down to solving uh, uh, really what you need to know is what the polarizability is at an imaginary frequency. Two approaches to do that are one is to use uh, Warden Drake's approach of getting the model spectrum and then putting a uh, negative an imaginary frequency into it. The other way is to go back to the differential equations, like this, and you simply write that then as a pair of equations for real and imaginary components of uh, the response, and that is what is being used in all of this. So uh, I uh, conclude uh, this talk by uh, saying that this was a method which was developed by uh, Alex uh, 50 years ago. It's been applied to many systems by many, very many authors uh, and may, <coughs> probably many who uh, don't know Alex uh, personally, but would have uh, seen it in the, all of this stuff in the literature. So it's been used, and in the applications have gone from the earliest studies of very simple atoms uh, right up to much more complicated systems now. The systems being looked at now, I mean, if you thought back to the 50s, would just be unbelievable that you could do this. Uh, this method will be, continue to be used, uh, as Avin sa said, the true legacy of Alex is whether the methods will continue. They're not just methods that are being developed, done, and that's it. These methods, the legacy, and just in this one topic, is that these methods are still being used and will continue to be used. I would, I, I'll come back to that slide just in a moment, but just to give you some idea of uh, the enormity of Alex's uh, output, 
and as I said, this is something like 5% of it. Here are just a few slides of showing uh, just a few references. <laughs> so there's about 55 references there, and that's just a fraction of the work that he has done. So I'd like to uh, uh, thank Alex for uh, many years, uh, 42 years of uh, friendship and interesting collaborations, and the opportunity to visit here often. I probably know, uh, uh, regard this as a kind of uh, second home. Uh, I also would uh, uh, like to thank the organizers of the uh, conference uh, for the invitation to speak. Uh, it, it's an honor to speak at this because, uh, as you can see, there's not that many talks in the program altogether, and as many people would have liked to do it, so I'm very pleased that I was asked to do it. So I'd like to finish then uh, by saying that, uh, as I say in the football terraces back in Britain, there is only one Alex Dalgano. Thank you. Well done, Michael. That was a truly uh, extremely interesting t talk, which really does show uh, one good idea just can be expanded all over the place. Uh, now, I noticed Derek, I haven't heard from you, Derek, for so long. I've got uh, uh, John Lewis, uh, was, of course, Um, the, the thing is that uh, Dr. Garnum and Lewis had quite a fortuitous incipient. Uh, John Lewis came up one year from Dublin Institute of Advanced Studies. He, by the way, he lectured to me at Oxford. Uh, he had been at RBAI like David Bates. And he recounted the following amusing tale. Bates called him in. No doubt he was drumming uh, the desk with his paper knife. And he, want, he said, well now, young man, I want to do second born calculations. And if you work uh, 40 hours a week, you will have so many calculations done. And then it will take you about a year. Uh, so John Lewis went away, thought about it, came back and said, sorry, David, I don't think I really would like to do that. In that case, young man, you will have to work with Alex Dalgarno. <laughs> what a privilege. Well done, Derek. Thank you. Okay, well, who could follow up with that? Uh, I, I it's a hard act to follow. Uh, uh, Ray, uh, Ray, I'll make another comment there. I didn't yeah, realize sure. that uh, you said John Lewis was at uh, RBAI. Uh, that, uh, just for those who don't know Belfast, that's, that's a famous school yes. in Belfast. And the reason I mention it is because I also was there. But I understand that David Bates... Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll come back to that. <laughs> uh, but I understand David Bates was there and didn't actually enjoy it as much as uh, uh, maybe some of the rest of us, uh, because he didn't uh, like rugby, I think. That's right. I, I, I didn't enjoy rugby either. At, uh, That's at right. I just uh, had to uh, put up with it. That's right. The headmaster there, Michael, uh, was putting rugby and football ahead of... Uh, and uh, uh, David just was completely unhappy there, and he left. But as it turns out, of, uh, in Estonians, as people who go to this place, it's called the Royal Belfast Institution, in, uh, academical institution. And in Estonians, as it was called, David Bates is probably one of the most uh, uh, famous of Estonians. I think Lord Kelvin also went to this school for nine months, and the school claimed him as one of their own. 